Okay, where's my life? There's my life. Live. Do I have viewers? Not yet. Okay. Hopefully I will have viewers soon. Hello. Hi, Mom. You did make it. And I'm still painting this. Because this is what sits on my desk at home for me to work on during live streams. But um, I'm probably going to finish it today and then hopefully get it uh, sent off. How are you? What's new? I'm going to get teacups for Birdie. Teacups? That's cool. Right, I heard about that, like a like a Bridgerton thing. Regency themed. Misha's got a costume. I feel like this is one of the well, I mean frequently for little kids parties, but this is one of those things where it's like the adults are gonna <laughs> probably get more out of this than uh the one-year-old, right? Yes, yeah, so this is going to turn into a textile pattern for my uh, Invisible Disability project. I'll send this to like I'll make it into a textile design and then um, my corset maker will make it into a corset and then I'm working on a grant application to the Canada Council now to the next stage of this project. Try to get some exhibitions lined up. How much is Eloise talking? I haven't I was I was supposed to go there couple weeks ago to babysit them and then that fell through because I was in hospital that day. I haven't seen them in a little while. Little boy by the time he turned one was actually speaking in sentences, well two word sentences but sentences and I remember Misha was quite the little talker at one but most babies are not. I did post this to my channel, right? Uh, uh, yeah, one. Oh, okay. Yes, 
so I did. There was an announcement. Sorry. In Discord, you mean? Or I mean, whatever. Oh, um, yeah, sorry, I, when I said channel, I meant my Discord channel. Um, so Lana had suggested that I need to always tag everyone, um, because uh, YouTube does not always send notifications to all the subscribers who have checked that they want to get notifications, so... Um, if people are on Discord, then they can see that. Not that I mind just chatting with you, but, you yeah, know, nice to have more people. I'm going to have to swap this water, though. It's kind of disgusting. One moment. I will be right back. Because I need to swap this yucky stuff. Mom, was it fall that you were wanting to go to Ukraine? Whatever Gia says. Okay. Um... So because, so I, I, um, I did not get all the grants that I hoped to get um, this past session. And initially I had this reactive, like, well, I'm just, I give up entirely and I'll, uh, whatever, and some pretty sad notions of my prospect. Um, but thinking about it a little bit more carefully, I think there's maybe some stuff that I can learn from the one grant that I did get. Um, and also just practically I should then um, focus on that. Initially it was going to be May, I don't think that's happening. Okay, well May is definitely not happening for me, but I am planning on applying to a new round of grants and one of them, um, instead of applying for the residencies and the other project that I was initially applying for for um, 
a research and creation grant, I think I'm going to lean into this project and try to get a trip to Poland um, in the next few months, but I do want to schedule it so that I get the grant results before I go take off and have an expensive trip. Um, So realistically, it'd be like five, six months from now, oh, yeah, something like that. Um, I don't want to push it too far for, you know, don't want to be uh, seven months pregnant on a <laughs> plane ride, uh, but If you tell Chia you'll join us in Ukraine, she will definitely make it work to your schedule. In Ukraine is beautiful. Well, I'm sure Ukraine is beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean... I can probably get funding to get as far as... Uh, certainly as far as Poland. Um, and I do have business there. Howdy, hope it's been a good week, doing some lurking while I cook. This piece is looking amazing. Um, it's been an interesting week. Uh, nothing bad. Um, news-wise, like, it's been, been fine. Um... My digestion has decided to start acting up again, which I'm not thrilled with. Um, and I've had some brain fog issues, which I think are related to just some hormonal stuff. So, that's no fun. But, uh, yeah, I am liking how this is going. Um, I was hoping to get to silver leafing soon, but I need to finish this and then scan it before I put silver leaf on it. Um, I potentially even photograph? We'll see. I'll try scanning and then I'll try, uh, and then if it, if I have trouble with the yellows, I'll also try having it photographed. Um, because yellows often scan really weirdly. <laughs> Oh, I might need to get it photographed. Um, I'm curious about getting it printed with silver leaf too. I'm trying to get as much as I can, like have a really solid presentation to present to granting bodies before I apply. Um, the grant I got for this I probably am still going to reach out to the advisor. I was waiting for the grant results to come through because I didn't want to come off as whiny, you know, right after I filled out the application, like, you need to make it. Um, but it is uh, specifically a disability arts grant, and so because it's targeted at people with disabilities, it, the structure of the grant, the structure of the form was so different from the other grants in similar categories, and just way, way, way more involved. It would be beautiful printed on fabric. Yeah, so that's the plan. So this is going to get, you know, repeated, um, and printed on fabric, and then turned into um, like applied to 
disability, like mobility aids. Um, so like corsetry, um, also possibly uh, things like a, a mobility scooter, etc. Um, and sort of tackling the idea of we don't always see um, we don't see people's disabilities um, and we don't see nature around us it's just like human blindness to many aspects of our world Um, and so yeah, so it'll be turned into fabric. I'm hoping I can actually get like, uh, metallic printed cotton for the background because so it's, this is like based on silver maples and so I'd like to get it silver. Um, so for the original I'm actually going to silver leaf it. I got silver leaf. Um, and so in a gallery presentation, it can be presented like that as well. Um, and then we'll see for fabric. Part of what I need to do is experiment with different fabrics and I'm hoping to get that, this one done soon so that I can apply, you know, with, with work, with direct work examples because I'm hoping that I can get granting bodies to pay for travel. Um, because uh, doing corsetry via Zoom is a little bit difficult. Anyway, um, it had occurred to me that I have some family members who want to visit Ukraine, <laughs> and that uh, Poland is right there. So, I don't know. I don't know how that works either because, again, this is, uh, this is grant supported. Um, so I'll be traveling on government funding, but they don't, you know, they don't pay for you to take your family trips. Um, I'm likely not going to be able to bring my service dog, uh, so I'll bring my human assistant instead. She's pretty excited about that. Would... should have been Will. My brain interrupted. I would wear a scarf. Yes! So it has also occurred to me that, like, I want to do this with, like, disability aids, but also just, um, like, some disabilities don't have, you know, an attached aid, a wearable. I mean, that's part of invisible as well, so, like, maybe some of these things just get turned into hats or t-shirts or, or scarves. Um, and some, like, and sometimes, sometimes aids are as simple as, you know, if you have Raynaud's, um, wearing, uh, you know, gloves to keep your fingers from freezing. Um, so... I started with corsets and, and disability aids. Again, a lot of it is just like, you know, speaking to personal experience um, where I have a disability that's, you know, other than the occasional, uh, other than the corsets and the occasional braces that I wear, like it's, it's not super visible. And then 
I have a service dog and because I look relatively healthy, um, I frequently get mistaken for a trainer. So my service dog, even though I have a service dog, um, actually frequently ends up having the opposite impact of people assume I'm healthier than I am um, because I've got her with me, unless I'm really showing some major symptoms. which is kind of wild. And then it's occurred to me, like I tend to cover up my corsets. I wear them under clothing. Um, but if I were to show them, they'd just be assumed to be a fashion statement. And I feel like the wilder I go with them, the more that's true. And so I'm trying to figure out what the performance art piece with this looks like. Um, but there is, there's something there. There's something there. That's what I've been on about with this for a while. I, like, I, I knew that there's something there. That's quite the dark spot. Hopefully I can work around that. Anyway, I don't know how realistic it would be for me to tack on a little tour of Ukraine <laughs> to my... Uh, work trip, but it seems so close that it's hard to, uh, hard to ignore that option, right? I'm gonna go get the grab some shots. That sounds amazing, thank you. Mom says I want to make that happen. Well, we'll we'll see. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh ifs ands. Like, there's no guarantee that I even get... I mean, it's worse than no guarantee. I thought that I had figured out... Um, I was so confident about my grant applications. And so wrong. Um, now, apparently... They just, they got swamped with applications this round, so part of it is just, you know, okay, only 16% of applications got funded, but I still feel like there's this thing that gets, you know, talked about in the, the art world about um, you need to apply to things, you need to put yourself out there. 
and be okay with rejection. You are going to get rejected, and, you know, if you're getting rejected less than uh, 75% of the time or something, which is, you know, I got 75% rejections from this round of grant applications, then you're aiming too low. And I feel like that, I mean, I feel like that's not, that shouldn't really apply to grant applications because it's not, they're not limited in the same way as um, applying for shows. Like, you apply for shows and they have, you know, we have two openings this year because the rest is already scheduled and they need to fit it into their gallery, they need to fit it into whatever, there's so however many people apply, like, you're going to get turned down a lot because your work just doesn't fit in with the gallery. With grant applications, theoretically at least, it's not supposed to be like, oh, this individual who are review these individuals who are reviewing your application do or don't like your art very much or don't feel like it it appeals to them like it's supposed to be just a uh, be more based on just like you know a really clear rubric of you know, there's a point system of how well did you justify your costs? How well did you justify your whatever? Like, there's a there's an artistic merit criteria, but it's it's not supposed to be a, um, you know, some individuals like your art or don't. Um, and I think that I should. Well, I mean, certainly I've like I've qualified for the section, so it's not for the category, so it's not like I, you know. My art's just not good enough. Yeah, um, that's not the issue. But but I haven't cracked the code of how to write grant applications that get funding. Some of my friends have. I have not. anyway, I will need to get some funding for, the, for this to work at all. If I do get funding, it'll be funding to go to Krakow uh, for like a week. Um, I should be able to get funding to bring Destiny along with me, which is nice. But I'll have to leave Ember because I can't imagine that it'll be straightforward to fly her around Europe. And then I keep having second thoughts about the residency that I was supposed to go to in May. I haven't... Uh, Hold them yet that I'm probably canceling but uh, I keep having second thoughts like oh but it is it is a really cool destination hmm. uh, don't know how many more opportunities I'm gonna get to do that so.
wild orchids sound delightful. Right now it's like false spring where I am. We've had a couple of very, very warm days, so it feels like spring, but we're still gonna have lots more freezes coming, so I have to manage my excitement. So the other thing in Krakow is actually uh, Roman Schmal's um, factory is there too. Um, and I don't think it's likely that I can, I don't think it's likely that I could get a grant just to go there. Um, and actually I suspect that uh, I'm better off not mentioning it than trying to like shove that into a grant application for an unrelated project, which is, I think, like, I'm trying to go through my grant applications and see where I went wrong, and I think part of it is, like, I try, I've tried in many cases to, like, gotten too ambitious about, um, you know, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this other thing, um, and that it is better to just be very, very, very specific about you know, I'm going to do this one thing, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to create this many pieces. It's hard. Um, because, like, they also want to see experimentation. They want to see, like, you know, if you've completely done the thing, they're not going to pay for art that's already done. Um, So it needs to be not done, it needs to be kind of a mystery. You can actually change what you do with the with your funding quite a bit. Hopefully you can keep up. Okay. I hope so too. Um, I've noticed a few times with my streaming, right now it says the health is excellent on the stream. Um, but I've noticed a few times in the past few weeks it will just suddenly start buffering after like an hour or two. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, but if if people are having issues with the connection, um, let me know. Uh, it should be fine. I mean, we do pay for nice internet here. Um, and I'm about to get my studio back. Ha! Ah! It's amazing, like my home studio. So I, I, I have a co-op studio as well, um, but I stream from home uh, for a variety of reasons, but largely because, um, I mean, it's private here, but also I have my computer, I have everything, uh, but the majority of my studio right now is taken up with Floorboards? Well, no, sorry, they're not floorboards. Um, they are wall cladding. They are, um, so we had pine wall paneling in the basement that we tore out, but we saved it all to refinish it and reuse it um, in the attic. We're going to use it for the attic walls, the eaves. Um, because in this economy, with the price of lumber, the idea of throwing out <laughs> perfectly good pine uh, is seems insane. So uh, it's just been sitting as we wait to get started on that project. It was hard to get this chat to show. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't really know what's going on there, um... I should probably do a little bit more, you know, research and figuring out 
outer. I used to be very on top of all the SEO and heck best practices and whatever. Like not that my my uh, videos were ever like super high production quality. There are budget constraints here, but um, I was very on top of, you know, what I should be doing, or certainly much more so than I am now, and I've completely let get that go. <laughs> My assistant, who is much younger than me, has a board that she keeps with, you know, tasks that were supposed to be on, and so... I'd poked her a few times about getting my social media rolling again, and at one point she had a whole thing about TikTok there. Like, TikTok, oh shoot. <laughs> That's a whole platform that I don't... I have... Yeah. Hmm. Now you want me to dance? <laughs> Nothing to make me feel old like that. Anyway, that's since disappeared. I do need to ask her what, what she... Uh, whether she still thinks that's a thing. I will listen to her if she if she has a plan there, but I'm not really sure how to like I struggle with even like the, the like the short format, the reels. Um I'm sure I could. It's just a like a whole extra mental thing to figure out and I've um Yeah, so now it's warning me that you might get buffering, but I don't, like, all my settings are the same, and I'm supposed to have really good internet, so I don't know what's going on. Mm, what is this? And then if I click it, it says open widget. Okay, well, how do I do that? Just says poor. Um, okay. It's back to normal. Okay. Uh, well, it might just update and tell me that it's back to normal in a little bit. Uh, if you see more buffering, let me know and I'll go uh, find the in-house tech support. It's gone again. Okay, good. Good, good. Yeah, seems like it's just some local internet spottiness. Can't do anything about being in Canada. TikTok makes my anxiety skyrocket. Well, it's too much info to quickly, and I haven't processed the things I just saw, and it's five videos later, the stories don't have endings, the list goes on. Uh, I've, like, I don't think I've ever, I mean, I've seen, like, TikTok content, but I haven't actually used TikTok, um, if that makes sense, because, like, TikTok videos then get ported to every other platform. Um, so, like, I'm familiar with what the concept is, but I have, I don't have a TikTok account. Um, I understand that it is the most popular, um, media platform right now. Um, 
and that, you know, gotta stay up with the times. When I was, um, when I started doing art and I was more involved for a while with the botanical art community, I've had some frustrations there. Um, but in some ways it's my niche. And at the time I was, you know, he was the youth. And I'm still very young compared to the average botanical artist, but at the time it was more striking. There was like, no, my average customer, my average buyer is younger than I am, which was more, you know, it was a bigger statement when I was in my 20s. Um, but it, it was also in the context of a, a uh, community where the average age is, you know, well past retirement. Um, and so they were talking about, we need to attract more younger people, but they were talking about attracting people in their fifties and like, no, you need to attract like young people, like young adults. Uh, and at the time it felt like, okay, I need to like really push this, this social media and like new platforms and stuff. And I'm not... I'm not of that demographic myself anymore. Um, I mean, I'm close enough that like, for sure, you know, there's definitely influencers on TikTok who are older than me. That's not a, that's not itself a, a blocker, but it's interesting that how things change. Hubby ends up there via Facebook in the 15 seconds of the same sound 15 million times. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, uh, that's, yeah. I guess the thing is, if I have a, like, I'm happy to, to take direction from, you know, my assistant, like, this is what you need to do and then follow that. But if it comes to like, oh, and now you need to figure out how to be popular with the youths on TikTok, like, oh my goodness, never have I felt so old. I'm sorry, I'm probably being pretty scattered and spotty today. I have some serious brain fog. I think it's hormonal. Uh, I had a breakthrough for a few weeks in there where I was just like, oh, okay, I don't have this, this like fog that keeps coming in. This is amazing. I'm like broken through something that's been affecting me for years. Um, I know it's back and I think certainly for right now what I'm experiencing is just progesterone messes with me. You're fine. Well, I'm glad I sound fine. I don't feel fine. <laughs> Tell me the answer, don't make me feel... F yes, exactly, exactly. I've done enough figuring out of equations uh, in, a, in my time as an engineering student. Um,
and this is my my struggle with my art career in general is there's a lot of like figure try to figure out okay how to how to manipulate this and how to do that and how to get popular on this thing and how to where to focus there's like a lot a lot a lot of decision points that aren't just make some art and yeah um yes I get the fog with migraines, and I know they can suck to navigate. Yes, I mean, right now I'm, I'm just at the point where, like, I have a whole bunch of video content that I want to put out, that I just don't have, like, the coherent mind to deal with. I need to put out, um... So here you can see me freezing, like, where was I? Because halfway through my sentence. So, sorry, uh, because I have paint palettes that I've ordered from Poland that are arriving sometime next week, um, I need to prep not only the, the, um, Oh my goodness, web store pages for those. Happy Friday. Indeed. Um, I need to prep the, the sale pages for those, but there's also a bunch of videos that I wanna put out and I want to put out, like I've, I've recorded a bunch of videos in ahead of the one announcing the palette. I wanna put those out um, spruce up my channel, get some traffic back to it before I jump straight in with the palette. It really is just a week of stuff, like I, I can just put it out and do it all over a week, but I just need my brain to be there enough to do that, and it hasn't been for the last few days. So that's my challenge. But hopefully next week will be better. My little tracker thing says next week should be better. Oh. I'm 100% sure it's because of BG. What? I have missed things. What's going on? I've been so out of the loop. So out of the loop. Lana, I've been thinking about you. I've been working on that uh, blanket. I got some really lovely yarns from my mother-in-law. Also, you missed the beginning of this uh, stream. My mom's on here. We were talking about my trip to Poland, which I'm trying to uh, get going. Um, so I have a grant for this project. This piece is for. Um, and I'm hoping to snowball it into a larger grant series and some exhibitions um, and I'm working this is a this is going to get turned into like a fabric design and um, it's going to be applied to some medical corsetry. Uh, my corset maker is in Poland in Krakow uh, as is Roman Schmal's factory. Um, I don't think that Roman Schmal's factory is relevant to my grants 
Uh, unfortunately, I think that actually adding that in is likely to just um, hurt, hinder, rather than help my application. Like, they want to see one idea, not like, here's 101 things to throw at the wall. Right, so it actually weakens it if I, if it seems like I'm just pitching everything. Um, and so, like, looking through my applications, it's like, okay, well, maybe that's what I keep doing wrong. <sighs> anyway, um, but I am hoping to go to Poland. Um, also, my family members, some of them might be trying to plan a trip to, to Ukraine. My mom and my aunt. Um, Ukraine being right there. Hopefully that'll be sometime like... The turnaround on the grant is like five months. I'm hoping to get this out in the next month. So like six months from now. Um, and I'll be probably doing things pretty quickly once the grant comes in. Like I'll try to have everything lined up before the grant. And then as soon as the grant comes in, then book tickets. Um, so sorry. Uh, if we say April, May, June, July, August. Uh, so like... Yeah, hoping for like late August, early September, September sometime. Um, we'll see. There's likely to be other factors that make me want to do this as early as possible. Um, and that also make this trip more relevant. Um, but if you are planning a trip to Poland and or Ukraine and or places, um, I can maybe figure some stuff out. I can maybe meet some people. I can maybe actually, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to overpromise because, uh, again, I also feel like I need to be fairly constrained in what I apply for and then I need to be fairly true to what I applied for. Um, but, uh, the truth is most, most ways to get to Poland have me through Germany. So might be able to schedule a meetup. But I avoid war zone for some reason too. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> my family is Ukrainian uh, and uh, I tend to avoid war zones, yes. Um, but uh, my aunt is, uh, you know, she wants to see her her birthplace uh, before she before she dies and I think the urgency given given the war has actually increased I mean I do think that it's a little bit questionable silly my mom can reply to this just how much they suddenly want to go to Ukraine now that there is a war like it seems a little bit of uh, awkward timing usually wars make me want to go places less but Uh, well, um, so my, my m mom's family, my great-grandmother, my aunt is my great-aunt, and my grandmother escaped from Ukraine in the Second World War. They are from a uh, sort of central Ukraine, um, Kamenets Podilski. It's very dangerous depending on where you want to go. Yeah, so they're not like really in the, um, like they're, they're, uh, the towns that they're from, um, are not, 
really in the, the hottest areas. Um, so it's not like they'd be going to the front, at least not on a like friendly go see your homeland trip. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, I have some very mixed feelings as well about that. I just, it's a thing that I know that my mom and my, my great aunt are planning. It's hard to, to say, oh yes, I'm just, I'm just gonna like drop by Krakow right around the same time that you wanna travel to Ukraine. And um, you know, these things have nothing in common. Don't even, don't even mind me here getting on a plane at the, to the same place at the same time. Uh, Not that Krakow is the... Yeah, but eastern regions are difficult too. Uh... Yeah, well, it's not really eastern like that. As far west as eastern Ukraine as still counts as Eastern Ukraine, or as it's far east as still counts as Western Ukraine, basically, um, and like, central. So, not, not the front, nowhere near the front, but not the front and not a target of just indiscriminate bombing either. I mean, there's still risks, and you still have to come into the country, right? Like, you... still not the 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 safest place, time to travel, but but not entirely wildly crazy. Um, anyway, my business is not in Ukraine; it's in Krakow, in Poland. Um, if you want, I know that the last time I mentioned this trip that you had mentioned that you wanted to go to Poland at some point. We can plan around that. I don't know that I'll make it into Ukraine at all. Though I imagine that I have some family members in this chat who will want to make some way for me to do that. Um, but my business is not in Ukraine. I think I'd be brave enough to go to Lviv, maybe it's close to the Polish border. I believe that that's the plan for getting in and meeting a, or the likely plan for getting into Ukraine and meeting a tour guide. Right, Mom? Mom can give some more details on what their thoughts are. Um, also, I think Rosa Gallery is in there somewhere, but I'm not sure. You know what? That's actually kind of interesting, too. Uh, and again, it's like, that's a very different um, reason to go than the, uh, than the grant for this. So I don't think, like, I, I considered like, oh, you know, it's appealing in a way to say, to have a whole bunch of things in one spot and be like, you know, you need to pay for me to go to Krakow for this project and so that I can speak to this guy and this and this and then this other thing, but unless they're very related, um, There's no air travel currently because of war. Yes, so that is absolutely a 
concern. I mean, so to be clear, I'm also still kind of hoping that I can get my assistance dog to come with me on this trip. I think that's unlikely um, because uh, she has legal standing in Ontario and Canada where I live, um, but our rules are very, very vague and very, very not restrictive and various countries in Europe have much stricter certification requirements for service dogs and the problem is if I fly into anywhere in Europe. Now I'm in Europe, if I travel to a different country, like getting from European country A to European country B, it is super easy to get stranded. It's actually easy to get stranded even trying to get on the flight back, like just because the airport in Canada lets me get on to a flight to wherever doesn't mean that I can easily get back. Now, it's helpful that a lot of the trains are just, they're pet friendly. So theoretically I could, you know, even if I fly into, I don't know, Frankfurt or something, then take a train to wherever, but um, I may want to help organize a lot, depends on my aunt. Yeah, trains are no problem. Yeah, so there's just some figuring out that I need to do about that. Um, there's a whole lot of concerns about, you know, traveling with a service animal is just, it's tricky. And I wish I could just, you know, I wish there was some test that I could just take to prove, you know, yes, she's, she's behaved appropriately and, you know, she's whatever but there isn't because there's no one, there's like assistance dogs international, but that's a very, it's a group of nonprofit um, service dog trainers. My dog is owner trained to do a thing that, you know, there are no local uh, service dog organizations, assistance dog organizations that train for it. So it's not like that's an option. Um, they won't test outside dogs. Some provinces in Canada have provincial testing that might help. I have one of the one of the residencies that I don't. I'm concerned that I, I don't. I actually don't think I can really reasonably afford to go to it. Um, but I have a an invitation a confirmed residency in British Columbia, and British Columbia has um, a service dog testing, like, by the government, which, I mean, of course, isn't recognized really outside of Canada, um, but it's at least something, like, here's a government form, which can help if you're in a different country, like, I'm sorry, I'm from Canada, this is my medical equipment, here's my Canadian documentation. Um, which helps, at least, because uh, in Ontario there's not even that. Um, so, you know, I have a letter from a trainer and I have a letter from my doctor and that's it. And the letter from the trainer is just optional because it sometimes helps smooth things over when I'm traveling locally but it's not actually required by local laws. If you land in Frankfurt, let me know. It's basically where I live. Um, Frankfurt is probably, like, very likely my first stop. Especially if I fly with Ember. 
So if I fly without ember, I have more options. If I fly with ember, if I sorry, if I fly without ember, I have more options because I can just take any flight that routes via wherever. If I fly with ember, I'm somewhat more restricted in terms of which airlines and which airports are likely to work. When I looked at this initially, it seemed like Frankfurt was probably one of my best options. Um, and then it would probably be fly into Frankfurt and then do a bunch of trains. Um, which vastly extends the trip. Uh, so I need to talk to Grant Advisors as well about that. Um, For Germany, you need certificate from a certain company or so. Yes. So in Germany, legally, you need an ADI certificate. Um, but I can't get an ADI certificate. Um, however, uh, many airlines will accept, like they try to, they try to accommodate the more permissive of like if you have a pair of countries so Canada to Germany or US to Germany especially US to Germany so actually that's probably the easiest is fly through somewhere in the US thanks I hate it um, but certainly Canada to Germany and I know people who have done this is if you have Canadian documentation and you get approved by the airline here then you can fly to Germany now, but that's like a one, you know, one leg. The problem is then if I wanted to tr fly from Germany to Poland, then it's two countries where, you know, I have some third documentation from Canada that doesn't apply to either law, <laughs> set of laws, like, <laughs> that won't help. You can take a dog, which would not be allowed in the cabin, but with luggage. Yeah, I'm not taking her in luggage. Like, it's not it's not happening. I would sooner leave her at home. Um, for her sake as well as mine. I mean, she is a medical alert dog. She is very helpful to be with me. Um, the, the last flight I took, I had an immune, like an autoimmune flare-up leaving the airport, um, and she did her little save my life thing. Um, so, you know, it, it's great to have her with me. If I can't have her with me, I'll bring a human assistant. I'll leave her at home with Jordan. I know people who have, sorry, I don't personally know people, but there are, it's a big topic of conversation within the service, the, the, like the assistance dog community, um, because it's a, it's a problem for everyone. Um, but especially, especially Canadian and American handlers who don't have like the, the, the legal requirements and also the availability of various things um, really depends on where you are. So like, yes, I mean, if I was in a, one of the different provinces that has um, provincial testing, that's a thing that some people use to help smooth over a travel. But anyway, there are there are Canadians who have traveled to, to Switzerland, to Germany, to uh, various places where the, the legal requirement is ADI, um, and they will face some challenges, but the getting on a plane is usually possible, just takes some doing. Now there is an additional challenge of, um, it's a very long period of time without a uh, 
a trip outside <laughs> without a pee break. And my little dog with her little bladder, she's not so little, but she does have a little bladder for how huge she is. Um, you know, there is a concern about like, um, if we're in airports for 14 hours, uh, now airports all, Frankfurt, Toronto, everywhere, have um, service dog relief areas. Uh, they are AstroTurf indoors and my dog refuses to acknowledge them as this is a peeing place. Um, and I'm, <laughs> to be honest, this is the sort of thing where at this point I might actually try to train her to use those, but we, <laughs> I shied away from it. She's two and a half years old, but until she was over a year old, we had major issues with housebreaking her. She had so many issues with not holding her pee inside. Um, never, we've never had issues like out in public when she's on duty. I mean, I've, I've heard horror stories from other handlers where like their dog gets diarrhea or something, <laughs> goes out, goes inside. That's never happened. Um, she's always been great inside. Um, on duty, but it's just, she was just, as a little puppy, she was just so bad. Her, her bladder control was just so bad. And we had so many setbacks. It's an, I think because we don't have emotional support dogs, they need certification. Too many incidents happened. Yes, so Canada doesn't have emotional support. Well, sorry, in Canada, only service like medical alert or sorry medical assistance dogs like medical service dogs are uh, recognized by our charter um, individual provinces are but it's left up to the individual provinces to decide how that's defined um, and because of like legal access challenges um, and lack of availability of, of like ADI programs. A lot of provinces have uh, ruled that, you know, for, for access reasons, um, you know, the, the definition of service dogs is much broader than you might find in, say, Germany, where uh, all all recognized um, assistance, assistance dogs need to be certified by Assistance Dogs International. Uh, now part of that is because you have more ADI programs than we do. Um, there's just, there's more availability of that certification. Um, part of it is other factors and other definitions and other reasons. Um, in, in the US, the, the distinction is an emotional support dog doesn't have trained tasks. A service dog needs to have trained tasks and um, help someone with a disability. Uh, in Ontario, there's no definition for emotional support animals. Like that's not a thing, but it, the word gets used a lot anyway because we're so close to the US. Um, the definition, like the, the certification in Ontario where I live is attached to the human, not the dog. So I have a letter from my doctor that says that I require a service dog to accommodate, to uh, mitigate the effects of my disability. Um, and then it's up to me to ensure that my dog is, that my, that my medical equipment is appropriately behaved for the situations that I bring her into. Um, 
and that's great and all like it it's it's helpful for training it's helpful for a lot of things and if the world was full of only responsible handlers <laughs> that wouldn't be a problem at all the issue is that then like even business owners they could always kick her out like if i take my if i go into a grocery store and i poop in the aisles and I scream my head off, they're going to escort me out. Likewise, if I bring my service dog, it doesn't matter if she knows tasks that help her, that like allow her to mitigate my disability. If she goes into a grocery store, she poops in the aisles and she barks her head off, um, they are allowed to escort my dog out because she's not acting appropriately. Like service dog or not, doesn't matter. Yeah, the U.S. is a special place. Now, even the U.S., they have restricted things very slightly. Um, but they're still, like, the easiest place to fly in and out of because their definition doesn't even require a letter from anyone. And in Canada, because it's left up to the provinces, it's like every province is different. And then we have a national transportation certification, whatever, a national cert, uh, sorry, and uh, my brain isn't working. Um, we have a national transportation organization, which is supposed to set the standards for um, any national travel. And they have set standards that don't match any province. So it's a little bit like even tr traveling within Canada is in some ways a lot more difficult than traveling out of Canada. Um, because out of Canada, uh, especially because most of our flights route through the U.S., um, so especially if you fly through the U.S., but also if you fly th with any of the airlines that any of the airlines that frequently fly th out of uh, fly through the U.S., then you get a much easier time than you would flying on national carriers. Nationally, it is a problem. Anyway, uh, I have absolutely, I, I understand and agree with the access reasons why um, it's not appropriate to demand that everyone get a certain certification. Like that means that then um, either you need a lot more funding for access to everyone gets an ADI service dog, or you need organizations willing to test, or something. All things that are not available, so for the, the access of people who have disabilities that have a service dog, um, you need to either have government provided testing, or, um, and which is difficult in Canada to manage because we're so spread out. Um, so it ends up being a huge expense and unavailable to a lot of people. Or you have to allow um, self-training and self-certification. So I understand all of that. That being said, for the, for the ease of, like, I do have a dog who I'm I, I've taken her on planes. Um, she travels extremely well. Uh, but it's every time we travel, it's a hassle. And for the sake of being able to take her internationally, it would, I would love to be able to just, okay, well, the, the standards is ADI, uh, the standard is ADI, so therefore um, I'll just get an ADI certification, but unfortunately ADI organizations in Canada um, do not certify, they will not test or certify dogs that are not 
trained by that organization. And there's no, like, it's not even that I could have found this, like, I could have gotten this a different way by having her trained by an ADI organization. Like, there are no organizations that train for the services that she provides in my province. Um, it's not an option. Uh, so, like, I've done my best with getting um, non, a, a non-ADI trainer to do a, a version of the British Columbia public access test. Um, so keep in mind, like, again, that's a different province. Um, so I don't have access to that test itself, but um, I, can, I can, you know, see what the criteria are. Um, and so I had a local trainer run basically a mock test um, and, uh, you know, put her name to, yes, this dog is properly trained. I have um, training logs, I have video, I have all her vet records, I have my doctor's letter times two. Uh, but, uh, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, there's no way for me to really get, like, a, um, at this point, for me to get ADI certification for her. Like, it's just not going to happen. So, that's one issue. There's also just an issue of, um, like, my concern with her traveling is that uh, while her, um, she's great on a plane, she just curls up and sleeps, um, but our last flight was, you know, just over an hour long. And even then, on an hour long flight, or uh, an hour and a half long flight within Canada, because I'm showing up with a dog, whatever, we have to show up three hours early. Then there's an hour and a half on the flight, then there's deplaning, whatever. By the time we're done, um, it was six it was over six hours um, between we got to the airport and she got we got off the airport to a different outdoor location. Um, and she wouldn't even pee there. It was seven hours by the time we got her to an outside place where she would pee. Um, so I think realistically for Europe, we would need to train her to either use um, like the AstroTurf inside uh, service dog relief areas and the... Uh, Um, in the airports, or, I mean, some service dogs are trained on, uh, like, pee pads. And, uh, whatever. We'd have to sort out some, some peeing solution, because, because I don't think that, like, we'd be pushing 14 hours. Yeah. So, some people will bring in puppy mats, take them into the washroom in in the plane and then the dogs can relieve themselves on the puppy pads. That's a thing that some dogs are trained to do. Um, many service dogs are trained to uh, to pee. I mean, Ember's trained to pee on command, um, but she just won't indoors. Uh, and so we would have to work on that, which I mean, absolutely we could do. I have not wanted to because uh, training her to not use inside was such a trial to begin with and like to this day she still has some uh, fights with my <laughs> husband about whether or not the area right beside the uh, cat litter box is for her. Um, so 
given that, it's like, oh gosh, this dog? Really, this dog? We want to train this dog to go inside? Um, at this point, I think it would be fine, but it's just, it's, it's a thing that we haven't done yet. So at this point, I wouldn't want to take her on a plane that, like, basically over eight hours, which basically restri restricts me to this continent. Are diapers an option? Oh gosh. Um, technically, yes. Uh, I have a major hate on for uh, people who put puppy diapers on their dogs for a couple of reasons. So the first one is it's very used by American handlers who have dogs who are untrained um, because the laws are so vague in the US and so permissive. There's handlers who will do things like fly to Florida with their little like five month old puppy and put a diaper on it and say, oh yes, this is my task trained service dog. See, my task trained service dog is trained to sit on my lap when I'm stressed out. Uh, which, I mean, it, it just, it really, like, you know, I recognize that, you know, there are situations, whatever, where it makes sense, but I just, it just, it really undermines the, like, no, this is a dog who is actually trained well, properly. Um, if you have dogs running through the airport who are not trained, like, it, it makes it more difficult for me to take Ember on flights, the fact that people take advantage of the system in the US to, to travel with dogs who are not trained at all and just do things like pop diapers on them. Um, the other thing is though, with any dog who is trained to not go on, you know, indoor floors, like Ember, um, they get very stressed out if they need to pee and it's not you know, the peeing place isn't available. Ember gets really stressed out if she needs to, she has decided that even like throwing up, when she's sick, she won't throw up inside anymore. Um, and so the idea of yes, and on top of that, you're gonna put a diaper on her, like, oh man, I can only imagine that would just, if she actually had to pee in a diaper, that would um, ruin her. Five-month-old puppy is not trained fully. No, it takes it takes at least like a year and a half to train a a service dog. And like honestly, Ember didn't really reach maturity until she was past two. She did her public access test at two and passed, but like in the few months after that, her maturity really jumped. Um, it's really like, she's, yeah. No, a five month old puppy is not, it's a puppy, it's a baby. hold it in until he feels really bad yeah yeah so that's that's what I would really want to avoid is like whether it's diapers or just like you know relieving herself even on one of the um like relief stations or on a puppy mat like you know would it be possible to get her to hold it in until she can't anymore and then provide a puppy pad yeah, but like, that's not how I want to handle this. That's terrible. Like it's, 
you know, and then, then she attaches all sorts of really negative associations to that trip, to that location. Um, so she's, she's been lovely on, on all kinds of travel, be it, um, trains or, or trains, buses, uh, airplanes. She's, she's, she's so sweet at airports. Um, she thinks everything's a puzzle for Ember, right? And she always wants to figure out, like, she's a little border collie and she wants to do the things and take, go to the place. Like, she's very, whatever, as, as orderly as, like, dogs ever are, right? the opposite of me so we go through the security line on our first flight and there's this whole theater where you know you take your stuff off you put it in the bin it does look like dandelion heads yes um yes anyway you take it you take your stuff off you put it in the bin you um whatever, all the things, and then you wait in line, and then when they call you through, you step through the little uh, magnetometer, and then they wave a wand over you, like there's a hole, and then you pick up your stuff, so Ember's looking at this as this, you know, this line comes, it curves around in front of us, and so she sees what each person does. Just, she's just sitting there staring, 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 staring. Very good, very good. We get to our turn and uh, security at airports, they don't really know what to do about dogs. Like that's not really a thing that they're, you know, they get some basic training about like every so often a service dog comes through here. Um, their training is supposed to say that they're not supposed to separate. They're not supposed to ask to separate a handler and a service dog. They're not supposed to t tell you to take the gear off the dog, but they don't actually know what they're supposed to do most of the time. Uh, and so Ember will, um, so Ember gets, we get to this, we get to the front of the line and they're just sort of looking at each other and like, uh, what do we, and so I offered, I didn't want to take her gear off. It's all full of metal. I said, she's gonna light up like a Christmas tree, but I can have her sit. I'll go through and then I'll call her through so you can scan us separately. They said, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. So I have her sit and she sits there all patiently. I walk through and go through and you know, grab my bin, start taking my stuff, call her through and she struts through, strut, strut, strut sits in front of the security guy, picks up her leash, and hands it to me. Um, at this point, we have been training, you know, get your leash, and she picks it up. But this was before we had ever done this. <laughs> she just... <laughs> that was her interpretation of how she is going to perform this thing that all the humans are doing. It was hilarious, and I had to keep myself from bursting out laughing because to the security guys, it looked like, you know, this is Average Tuesday for her. She's done this a million times, and they're like, okay, she's an expert. Like, go through. Both, both like, that trip and the return, the, we had a whole binder of her documents. We were so worried about, I was so worried about the the airport and getting stranded somewhere and because she's I guess a good little actress <laughs> uh, we got asked for completely irrelevant documentation once at a check-in counter at the very beginning and never again <laughs> oh, she's picked up her stuff too yes exactly do what the humans do. Yeah.
Yep, and then on the plane she just curled up at my feet and took a nap. So that, like, traveling I'm not so... My concern would be just, it's a very long trip, so we would need to sort something out for peeing, um, just for her sake, and if we haven't then it's just not, it's not kind to her to travel. Um, and then, regardless of that, there's some... I can probably get her to Europe, but then, depending on what we're doing traveling around, um, I have no confidence of being able to get on a second flight once I'm out of Canada. She has her moments. I mean, when she's off duty, she can be a real little, real demanding little pill. She's a dog. Uh, very much just a dog. Um, sometimes she's a bratty little dog. It is also 14 hours without movement. Yes, um, so... Okay, so that's the other challenge, is within national flights, like, getting her approved as a service dog is a little bit challenging, but within Canada we do get an extra seat at no extra charge. Um, on an international flight. I mean, the thing is we could buy an extra seat uh, just to bring her, or we could get, or since I'll probably have an assistant with me anyway, we'd have an extra seat. She sits in the legroom area. She can rearrange herself if she has two, two side-by-side -side seats. Um, So, you know, sit up, turn around, um, and then, you know, walk the aisles a few times. Uh, it's definitely not pleasant or ideal. We get tons of exercise before, but it's, that part is possible, certainly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely just like, all kinds of concerns. It's not... And like, she's helpful, but she's not the only way I can survive, right? Like, I did travel and do things before I had a service dog, and granted, like, I got a lot sicker, but like, I lucked into this service dog, and it's not clear that I will always have a service dog, so it's just... Um, I'll do a trip regardless. It's, un it's not clear to me whether I can bring Amber or not. Um, it seems actually likely not. Like, I'm talking about all that it would take here, and like, yeah, I could do this, and I could do that, but like... Realistically, when I think about it, the chances are that probably it'll, you know, when it comes to it, I'll just decide that it's it's a better choice to leave her home. Um, and I will have an assistant with me regardless. Uh, She rode in an ambulance with me the other week. That was fun. I mean, it wasn't fun for me, but she enjoyed being the extra good girl who gets to go in an ambulance. Oh. 
Most dogs don't get to do this. There's a meet here, here you won't. No, so for international flights, it's not, yeah. For international flights, if I need extra room, I need to buy a second seat. Or something. Um, it's only within Canada. For, for national flights, national travel within Canada, so whether it's flight or, or train or anything, um, if you have a medical service dog, they need to accommodate. So if you have a tiny dog, it's fine. Um, but they actually have uh, like def defined sizes of dogs and they need to accommodate the space. So for a dog ember size, they need to give me a second seat. Like it's, it's a, at no extra charge. So that is a legal requirement for carriers within Canada. Um, they still, they screw it up. Um, and it's poorly understood and they'll try to find, they'll try to disqualify dogs because obviously nobody wants to give you a second seat for free. Um, so that's part of what makes it difficult to uh, get a an airline to take service dogs like it's 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 a problem but it's also you know it is neat because it does mean that she does actually get the space that she needs to comfortably sit um, she can fit between my legs but that would be really uncomfortable certainly for a 14-hour flight I would want extra room It is a very nice place to live. I, I do very much like it here. Um, Okay, I'm going to move this back and cover up the bottom with a different paper over here so that I can work on these parts. She also said, come back for their later years. Yeah, um, so puppies are little terrorists. Um, Ember was an absolute monster for the first, oh, like seven months of her life. Um, the idea of like, oh right, yeah, service dog when she was five months old. She did start alerting when she was seven months old. Um, and so we did really kick up her training at that point. Um, and I got, I got my doctor's letter for her, so like officially she was a service dog in Ontario when she was 11 months old, but there was no way, like I was taking her into, I didn't take her into non-pet friendly places at all before she turned one. When she turned one, I started training non-pet friendly venues, but like 15 minutes at a time, if that. Um, the idea, like, you know, it, the service dog world is interesting, and there's definitely, 
you know, because there's all of these access issues, there's all of these discussions about how to circumvent this and how to circumvent that. And, um, oh, here's the documentation you need. But then you get people who are just really not, not honest brokers who really want to take advantage of that. It's really difficult, like in a, you know, they may even be, they may even be disabled and need the services of a service dog, but it's just not like, okay, but, you know, it creates access issues. Um, it's like, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to say like every person is an ambassador for their whole disabled community, but, uh, And I try not to get too worked up about other people's training of their dogs. Not my dog, not my problem, but... But! But! Here, I'll just, uh, see about adjusting this focus. Wait one moment. There. Like this. And will that, where are we at? Come on, go back, go back, go back. Okay, there, mm-hmm. bad apple can ruin the batch and so I try to try to be really careful with Ember that I mean I always feel super awkward because she's such a little I mean she's a dog they're all dogs but um, some service dogs are, are like serious off-duty Ember's a little monster off-duty I mean not monster but like She's goofy. She wants to run around. <laughs> she wants to meet everybody. She thinks everybody's her best friend, especially any dog who happens to be walking the opposite way. She, she'll lie down to greet them. Like, okay, well, she doesn't do this on duty, I swear. She doesn't do this on duty, I swear. <laughs> Could I have just rotated the piece? I did do that earlier. Um, it, it does have actually a clear bottom in the sense of like the shadows are all fairly directional. Um, so it felt really weird for me to rotate it. Did you sketch it first with a fountain pen? I sketched it sort of halfway with a fountain pen. Um, so I do have a fountain pen here. I've been alternating pen and watercolor for a bit. Um, yeah. I did the basic outline and a few little spots in the middle for each one, and then I've been going back and forth with watercolor and pen and watercolor and pen and building this up. Um, I pulled up a bunch of pictures, some of them mine, some of them from other people of, uh, this is Xanthoria periotina, it's a maritime sunburst lichen, it's a very, very common, um, 
lichen on street trees here. I think it's actually all across Europe too these days, but it's, um, It's, it's lovely to be goofy off-duty. There's, there's just certain behaviors. So when she's on duty, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the standards in the ADI tests or um, the, the provincial tests for the, the provinces in Canada that have provincial tests, um, is they are non-reactive to other dogs. Now, Ember doesn't really bark at other dogs per se, usually, um, but she thinks every dog is her best friend, and she'll lie down to greet. And then she wants to play if the other dog is playful. Um, if the other dog does react to her, she may react back. Now, this is all off-duty. Um, the majority of the time when we run into other dogs, we're off duty. When we're on duty, I have been pleasantly surprised many times where, you know, oh, okay, we are in the parking lot of a store. She's still got her gear on. Another dog comes running and jumps on her and she just sits there. Um, or we're in an airport and there's a silly puppy going crazy and she is very focused looking at me. She <laughs> understands the concept of she's at work and she understands the concept of other dogs are at work and she's not supposed to distract them. Um, and she takes her job very seriously. It's very cute. Uh, but I worry because the truth is most of the time on duty we don't run into dogs. And when we run into dogs off duty, she frequently does want to lie down to greet. She's a little bit hard to redirect. Um, and she will occasionally even bark at them. Not generally, she's not the one doing the first bark. Um, the standards do say if a, if a, you know, a calm, friendly, non-reactive dog comes close, uh, which is usually fine even off duty, but it's just, You know, there's things that's like, I don't get to, I, I see her interact with other dogs off duty all the time. And her, her behavior is a little concerning. Not, not in a, like, she's mean, but just in a, she's very focused on the other dog rather than on me. Sorry, even off duty? What do you mean? She always wants to be friends with other dogs. She doesn't bark at them. Unless they're barking back at her. It's, so it's, right, but the problem is like, to what extent does that behavior carry? And because all, uh, on duty, usually we're in like a store or something where she's not going to run into a lot of other dogs. Um, even though I've been very pleasantly surprised over and over again, the few times, but like over and over again, like the, you know, six times where she's had a face to face with another dog on duty, it's like, okay, that always went well. But, you know, every day we're out walking and we're walking on a trail and she sees another dog come down by and she lies like a pancake on the trail. Or in the middle of the road. Oh, here's my best friend. And like, okay, Amber, come on, come, 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 come. <sighs> but my friend. I want to see my friend. Please, can I go see my friend? Um, if I notice the other dog before, I can usually just get her to follow me, like, with a treat. Call her back. She does come back on trails, even if there's other dogs. Um, but... But there's definitely, there's behaviors that she shows reliably off-duty that would not be good if she did them on duty. Would not be good in a public access test situation. 
and uh, it's hard. It's hard. It's always hard. Um, on duty, the truth is there's very few dogs, and if there are, uh, we generally know what's going on. Like, you know, we're at a gallery opening, and the, the gallery attendant will point out, like, okay, there's already a seeing eye dog inside. Like, okay, well, Amber, you're just going to ignore. We're going to stay away from the other dog. Don't distract. Oh, are you seeing the distracting other dogs on duty when she's off duty? Yeah, she does that one off duty. She, she's, that is very cute. That is very cute. Because um, we taught her she's an extra good girl and she has her extra good girl vest. So she has to work. She has to show she's extra good when she's her, in her extra good girl vest. Um, and she's working. And so she knows all those words. And she knows that there are behaviors that she's not supposed to interact with people. Um, she's not supposed to approach people. She's not supposed to approach other dogs. She's supposed to stay focused on me. She does really, she does behave very differently when she's on duty versus off duty. Um, and she just turns into this little like, I'm just showing off. She won't seek out attention from people but she'll just like sit there smiling like oh yes I am a good girl I hear everyone talking about how what a good girl I am um, uh, but if we're like at a festival or something often there's like a festival or even just out um, like at some dog-friendly stores or something. There's sometimes um, people with, with uh, often it's like puppies in training. And she has learned to, like I've, I've uh, when we run into, like when I see like, oh, okay, Ember, that's a good girl like you. That dog is working. No distracting. You have to let that good dog work. And she's like, okay, I let that good dog work. <laughs> I'm just going to walk by. I don't want to distract the other dog. <laughs> um, I do feel bad sometimes when I tell her the other dog is working and it's very clear to both of us that the other dog is not working very well. Um, we were leaving the grocery store at one point and there was a dog who was not on duty, like no kind of on duty, just by the front door. Like they'd gone through just the very front door of the store. I think it was just like a pet dog that belonged to one of the staff members. So they weren't in the grocery store exactly, but they were like in the inner doors, if that makes sense. They hadn't gone to where the food was. Um, but Ember was just leaving, you know, she's, she's about to get her gear off, and so she's all excited, and she's like, other dog! I'm like, Ember, you can't distract, the other dog's on duty, everybody's working here. She's like, oh, okay. So she starts walking by, and the other dog, meanwhile, is jumping up at her, jumping up on its owners. <laughs> and she's looking like, that dog works weird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, part of it is just this, like, imposter syndrome, too. Like, part of it is silly, but it's just, I, I don't live in a huge town, right? So it's like, I do worry that, like, okay, people see me here, and then they see me next week at the grocery store with this dog who is, like, totally silly, jumping up uh, a few days ago. They're like, uh, right, service dog. In general, it's like, yeah, well, I mean, we very rarely have any issues anymore in, like, stores or anything. Um, if she's having an off day, she's having an off day, she stays home. And if we have to step out of somewhere, like, if we go somewhere and she's just not behaving, 
you know, it, it, it's only happened like, I think twice in the past year where I've just decided like, nope, you're not, you're not focused. We're done. Um, and, uh, then we, we leave the, whatever we were doing. Um, and like, so as far as her actual behavior on duty, like I have absolutely no complaints. Um, she's pretty great and pretty reliable. Um, off duty, she's a puppy. And on the one hand, I'm very, she's a happy, goofy, overly friendly, ridiculous puppy. Also, she's sassy and demanding and barks at me at home and barks at my assistant and... <laughs> the dog must be alerting. That's right. That's what the dog's doing. And Dante has to behave. Yeah, exactly. It's just... It's, you see the same people over and over again, right? So it's like I run into someone and they're like, wait, didn't I see you at that store? This is a service dog? Like, yeah, well, right now she's just being silly. Right now she's just, she just wants to play with your dog. Um, she's not on duty. Uh, which I think is really important from a, like, yeah, like, she likes working, but we want to keep it that way, right? Like, and it's, she likes working because it's a sometimes thing, and then other times she gets to run around and be silly. Uh, and I do want to let her be a dog. Um, you know, some, some dogs do want to be at work all the time. She's not one of them. Or certainly she doesn't want to be, you know, on, on uh, you know, grocery store rules all the time. She wants to, be, she's super friendly, she's super social, she gets a real, she likes, you know, she's smart, she knows it, and she wants to show off, so she gets that out of on-duty behavior, but she doesn't, um, she doesn't, you know, she's, she, she wants to run around, she wants to play with other dogs, she wants to, and I want to, like, allow her to do that. But it's also just a... balancing it with... Vegetarian, sorry, uh, there's a little heart thing. Oh, vegetarian, uh, chili with quinoa, fresh fruit, and apple pie. That sounds really nice. Yeah, even like when we went to residencies, um, the one residency I went to last year that I'm going back to this year, um, it's on this island in Lake Superior. So it's like this tiny little island, like pretty far north um, in a giant, like, you know, sea-sized lake. It's it's a very big, cold lake and it there are ships through it. And Ember, Ember's not territorial at all, usually. Like people can walk into our house. She doesn't bark at the doorbell. She doesn't, whatever. Um, but it's very situational because because she's used to chaos. So like in a chaotic situation, like we've trained her to like, okay, well you walk through the airport and when she's in a situation that she's not familiar with, she just turns to me and like, okay, well you seem fine with this, so we're good. Um, which is ideal, it's great. Um, and then because nobody else seems to be bothered by the doorbell, she's not bothered by the doorbell. But in a situation where it's very, very quiet, very, very constrained, anything out of the ordinary, she's like, um, that's not right. So we were at this residency and there's like 
this island has no permanent population. It's run by a lighthouse association, which is like, like a mom and pop, uh, or really pop and pop, uh, non-profit. And so really the, the, like the closest thing to the, uh, to, uh, like resident there is the, uh, the lighthouse keeper, the, the president of the lighthouse association, you know, he doesn't live there all year, but he does live there half the year. And every time he'd walk up, you know, she goes crazy barking, like, you're in my house, you're in my house. She started barking at, like, big cargo ships in the distance on the horizon. The heart is super annoying. Yeah! The heart is super annoying, but as hospital fare goes, that sounds um, pretty nice. Just hospital fare can be really hit and miss. We can make it move. Well, it just blocks the bottom, co the edge of the bottom comment, so it makes it a little bit difficult to read comments as they show up. Can I wait? I can move it. Let's see. If I just, how do I? I can, I can make it send up things. How do I move it? So yeah, lots of little things that we have to keep working on with Ever, but actually like on duty she's she's great. Every so often I second guess myself. Like, does she really understand the distant difference between on duty and off duty? whatever and then you know I'll just be walking her through a downtown on her harness and she's everywhere she's like I'm lying down I'm pulling this way I'm sniffing that thing I'm whatever like oh right and when you're on duty you walk right beside me <laughs> yeah you do understand huh neat Click it, it should float a little bit for you. Like when I click it, I can, nope, can't move it. They're smarter than we think they are. Yeah, in some ways. Um, she definitely, like, she picks up a few things. Uh, my dad was saying, because I talk to my dog a lot, and she'll, you know, Woo, woo, woo at me and I'll just interpret that as whatever she's saying and my dad's like you know I often think that you uh, attribute too much to that dog that she's uh, not saying all these things that you say she's saying but then when he was over here last apparently she uh, very clearly nudged him took him over to where dinner was ready like to show him, you know, oh, okay, look, there's meatballs over there. Have you noticed that there's meatballs over there? <laughs> and he was like, and that was very clear. So, you know, maybe she's actually saying more than I think she is. And I'm like, well, the truth is her thoughts are not that um, 
she can communicate her thoughts very clearly. She'll throw, like when she, she, our neighbor has a campfire. She always wants to go see the campfire, right? And she knows that if I'm just going downstairs without wearing socks, without anything, without getting dressed up, I'm not actually going to take her outside. I'm just going to let her out on a tether. So she'll ask to go outside. You know, she, she has her word for outside and she camps herself by the stairs. I'm like, okay, let's go outside. And I, she looks at my feet, looks up at me, looks at my feet, runs into the bedroom and starts throwing laundry at me. Okay, yes, I know. You, you're no, you don't actually want, you don't want to go outside alone. You want me to go outside and you know that I'm not going to go outside dressed like this. Um, cuddle him with hands saying that I'm eating him. And pretending to take his hand in my mouth, take my hand in his mouth, and then he jumps away playfully. Oh, bye. Bye! Yeah, uh, Ember will... Ember, when, so she's half border collie and she, so she wants to herd, like that's what she does all the time. She wants to take you around, show things, whatever, put you away. Um, put the humans in the human place. Okay, I need to take you to bed. Um, and when she was younger, a lot of her communication was by, like, she'd bite, right? When she was a little puppy, like puppies nip, they bite, and she'd try to physically drag you. And for all of it, I corrected it. Like, no, you can't bite. Find a different way of communicating. And mostly, she has, you know, she nudges, she boops, she circles, she verbalizes, she waits by where she wants to go, she shows you things. Um, but the one thing that I didn't correct because it was so funny is when she wants you to scratch on top of her head, she'll grab your hand and try to put it onto, so like, she'll grab your hand and try to put it on top of your, on top of her head. Like, it doesn't work that way, dog. I'm trying to put it on top of my head. <laughs> he understands the game. Dante never bites, he also never barks. When he barks during play because he's excited, he looks terrified of himself. Uh, well, right, so she won't bite down, but she'll just, she'll just, uh, like, when she was a puppy, yes, she did bite. Because puppies are evil. Um, <laughs> she doesn't bite, but you know, she puts her, her teeth there, and if people aren't expecting it, it's like, uh, uh, on the one hand, I kick myself over it because she will just like greet people and hello, 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 and then try to grab their hand. And it's like now I have to like, I see it coming. I'm like, she's going to grab your hand. She wants scratches behind her ears because it's her favorite place to get scratches. And that's her code for I want scratches on the top of my head behind my ears. And she'll just get your hand and try to put it on top of her head. And because it's so funny, I didn't correct it. So instead, like that's just stuck. And now it scares people. Um, she doesn't do that on duty because she's not allowed to seek attention on duty. So that's a prop, not a problem I have to worry about. But if she's at the dog park or something. <laughs> Ember doesn't bark when she's playing with other dogs. She does bark sometimes when she's playing with humans. Um, and it freaks other dogs out because if she's play like if she has her her dog friends and they know that she doesn't she's not a barker so if they hear her bark they think it's a big deal but it's not it's just that she's she's found some human that she wants to rush roughhouse with it's a little bit absurd yeah ember ember's little bitey thing she does for everyone She also likes playing show and tell with her toys. She brings them outside and with humans, she'll show them like one by one. Look at this, I have this, this is an amazing toy. 
now their lichen looks like cookies must be because I'm eating. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of eating, I should probably go have some soup soon. Uh, so I think I'm gonna wrap this up. I wonder how lichen tastes now. I think, I think that some types of lichen are edible. Don't know about this one. Yeah. yeah, Dante's sweet. Ember started doing the thing, so she her best trick has always been when she's waiting. Um, so she she'll I'll put treats on her paws and she'll wait. And she actually she really loves doing this on duty because she's not allowed to. She knows she's not to like go ask for attention, go seek out attention from people when she's on duty. So she has to focus on me. She's she's good at that. Um, but she still wants people to acknowledge that, like, she wants to hear all the compliments. That's what she lives for. So, you know, uh, her idea of a good time is, can I lie down in the middle of, say, the meat department, surrounded by all the best foods, and I'll lie down there with treats on my paws, ignoring all the meat around me and the treats on my paws. Real, I think Dante and I are a perfect team, but Liam members sound perfect too. Yes. Yeah, you and Dante do sound like a perfect team. Um, anyway, uh, so she, she'll just lie there with her treats on her paws, and you, you know, she can, you can wait several minutes, walk around the corner, come back. She's still lying there with her treats on her paws. Um, great big smile, because people, oh, wow, look at that dog. Yeah, um, but recently she's gotten into the habit of you'll tell her she can have the treats and she'll look down. She's like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm hearing lots of compliments. I'll just stay here with these treats. <laughs> okay, weirdo. Off. Oh yeah, oh yeah, all show off, all sass. Anyway, um, I should go eat as much as my stomach will allow me. Um, so I think this is it for today. Thank you for joining. And then hopefully, here, I'll uh, actually zoom out first. Do -do 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 so that we can see this whole thing again and how it's come along. Wait, no, not that one, this one. Here, here, there. But it is coming along. And then soon, soon, hopefully I put some silver leaf on it. Bye everyone.